Hello, this is Michael Reese. Welcome to Ad Hoc, a virtual talk series. I'm a sculptor and new media knot. I'm here to have fun and sharp conversations with some of the smartest people in art, technology, and sculpture. My interests and those of our guests will range far and wide and focus on making and the artist's role in our current era. We'll be talking to artists, curators, designers, and more. Welcome to Ad Hoc. So, um, so good, Tommy, it's always good to see you. It's a pleasure to do this. I'm going to just like uh, say a couple of things. Um, you know, this is going to be part of an ongoing talk series that I'm going to do. And it's going to be kind of in combination with the International Sculpture Center. And we're going to, it's me, you know, initially talking about our show and our book and what we did but it'll move into talking with other people and other artists and stuff like that. And I hope it will engage, uh, for example, you know, the life of, and personality of the person I'm talking to, not so much me or my thing. Mm -hmm. And so without saying much more than that, you of course were the curator of this show, which was called Synthetic Cells, Sight and Parasite. Right. And you and I worked really closely together, traveled yep. all over the world. Really fantastic. And, uh, and then we also realized the catalog, which, uh, <laughs> you know, was kind of like, uh, I think the catalog was harder than the show, really. Uh, <laughs> In some ways. <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is, is that, um, you know, uh, you have as big a view into this project as anybody. And so I wanted to uh, welcome you. Uh, not only were you the curator of the show, you've been the curator at Grounds for Sculpture since 2011, I think it is. That's right. And then you also were a big part of uh, art in public places in New Jersey from something like 1982, or was it 86? Yep. 1982, actually a little bit earlier, 1981. For 1981. October all, of 81, yeah. All the way to 2009, is that right? Yep, 2011. Oh, 2011, okay. Yeah. Good. And so you're responsible for much of the public art. I mean, responsible in the sense that you manage that program, you work with the artists, you facilitated all kinds of details, uh, the fungible details. So that's who you are in a nutshell, but <laughs> it hardly covers it, right? <laughs> that's, that's kind of you, thank you. Yeah, but it hardly covers it, right? I mean, uh, the other thing that I think is really important to note is that you're a sculptor. Yeah. And you've been a long time sculptor. You still make sculpture, right? You Absolutely. Still, yeah, you still do things. And it, it kind of reminds me, you and I were in China. I think, uh, I can't remember, I think we were in Shanghai and we were visiting the, uh, the sculptor, uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank on his name. You know, Mas Masayuki, yeah, right. And uh, we were talking about how in China, which is a little bit of the wild west, you know, there's a little, you know, a little rough around the edges about you know, certain sort of uh, standardized practice, et cetera, of museums and stuff, how there were so many artists that were the curators mm -hmm. of huge exhibitions and huge art spaces and stuff like that. And I remember in that moment, it was kind of like a lightning bolt. And I realized that one of the reasons that we were able to do what we did was because you had that, I don't know how to describe it any better, but to say that internal view of being an artist, working with an artist to realize a vision, you know? And uh, I, wonder if, I wonder what you thought about that. I wonder how you think about, uh, you know, curators and, and sculptors and practitioners being curators and you must have some thoughts. Well, I, I do, from the, from the very beginning. Um, well, the beginning, I'll, I'll, start, uh, I'll start in graduate school at Rutgers. Um, um, I, uh, the dean of the school at the time, John Bettenbender, and I hit it off. He was a theater guy. And he um, not only admired what I did, but he also understood that I had a capacity to manage things. And so he counted on me to help with the, um, uh, the new school, it was the Mason Grove School of the Arts. It had currently, it had pre previously been at Douglas and in Douglas College, which is part of Rutgers, and, but it, 
they basically created this new school. And uh, I, I was there in 1977 when it was uh, formally created. And uh, so I, I had a lot of interaction with the department and served on faculty committees as well, uh, faculty hiring committees. Uh, you know, it was really, really an amazing. Um, but you were a grad student, is that right? The grad student. Yeah, you were a grad student, but they invited you into being the, the voice, of, the sort of the voice of the artist, the voice of the student body. Exactly, and that's, that where that, that's where I started to really hone my skills with the, um, the ability to work with artists on, what they wanted to do as well as do my own work and also work with administration. And that was, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't think about how important that would be at the time, but it became very, very important mm -hmm. in terms of how I was able to maneuver through my career, you know, uh, which is, you know, over 40 years of, of my, my being an artist as well as doing the various things within the um, visual arts. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. And um, I mean, you know, part of it too is that you are capable of, uh, I don't know, being a sounding board in a way. The, um, the thing that I've noticed through the many years of doing this, no matter who I work with, there's a comfort level that they have when they find out that I'm an artist as well as uh, someone who is managing the project and they know, and it's true, they know that they have, I have their best interests at heart, heart, at heart rather, in order to make their project successful. And, and for many years, I was always sort of the um, negotiator between the parties. I would have architects and, uh, you know, uh, clients who saw things one way, the artists saw it another. But I also knew that you had to trust the artist and I had to be able to convince the uh, client or the architects if they had a discomfort level just to, you know, please be patient and see how this evolves. And most of the time, everyone was so um, amazed by how, by just lightening up a little bit and giving, giving the, empowering the artist. Uh, you know, some architects, it was difficult for them to do that, but many of them were happy that they did when the, when the results were, were uh, forthcoming. Yeah, that, I think that's uh, kind of an amazing insight. Uh, you know, again, you, you kind of understood the creative process yourself, but specifically around being an artist, right? Okay. I got a vision, I got a feeling, I'm gonna feel my way into that thing. And you know, oftentimes it's it, you know it seems uh, easy on one level to say the words, but to create institutional trust in professional situations is really a complex thing. Right? And that, another uh, form, another important formative thing was I uh, went to a museum school. You know, back in the '70s, the Boston Museum School, the Worcester Art Museum School. The, there were a lot of museum schools that were. And I grew up in New England and I went to the Worcester Art Museum. And um, that was an important interface because not only was did I have this fantastic studio, but I was att physically attached to a museum. So I would actually spend time walking through the museum every day. I even became a night watchman just to make money. And I also worked on the installation crew and, uh, you know, so this was really another whole dimension of being an artist, seeing how curators work, seeing how installers work, seeing, you know, seeing, you know, huge Kenneth Nolan paintings being installed. And, uh, you know, it was just a fantastic experience to be around that day and then go back to your studio and, and work for a while and then go back to the museum and work an 11 to 7 shift where you're alone with all these artworks and it, you know, it's like, it was such an amazing form, formative time for me to kind of put it all together. Right. Well, uh, you know, the other thing, Tom, that I've noticed about you, and I've remarked on it several times, is how much you uh, celebrate, admire, love, and connect with other artists and artworks, right? 
Thank you. Yeah. You, you know, for example, you started talking about this historical moment when the Douglas, which was an all girls school at Rutgers, yeah, right, right, or an all women's school college, I should say, and uh, transformed itself into the, you know, that the art department there transformed itself into Mason Gross, which is a big deal. And I believe Mason Gross, the the president of Rutgers at the time, had an insight into that and really pushed for that. Yeah, and, Mason Gross hired uh, Roy Lichtenstein to be yeah. a faculty member at Rutgers, and that train. It's a it's a very very interesting historical sto story about how Lichtenstein being on the faculty, moving to Highland Park, you know, bringing the art world to New Brunswick, and you yeah. know, George yeah. Siegel interface, the Klaus Oldenburg interface, the yeah. Fluxus. That's an amazing story, an amazing story, and there have been some books and exhibitions about it, but that set that school, Mason Gross truly set the school on, a, on, on an important journey. And by Mason Gross, you mean the president of Rutgers, Mason Gross, set correct. the school on an amazing journey, on an yeah. amazing trajectory. Yeah, that's correct. It was, yeah. He was the president of the, of, the, of the school during a very, very formative and important time in the 1950s and 60s. But then Tom also, I mean, every time I've met you, many times at Grounds for Sculpture, because you were the curator there, et cetera, you would tell me stories about various people and their connection and interaction and relationship to art in New Jersey, Grounds for Sculpture, art in New York. Uh, I remember the, uh, the, the show of the architect, Robert Graves, uh, is, you, you know, you talked about that amazing city that he proposed that was in between, I can't remember, was it in between Newark and New York? Was it? New York, New York and Washington. Oh, the, New York and Washington, sorry, New York. It was much bigger than that. Okay, good. Yeah, but, uh, but the vision he focused on was the one from uh, New York through New Jersey. Yeah. And it was called the Linear City. It was the Linear a City, right? Brilliant piece. It's and actually- no, but, but you knew that. And you <laughs> knew it because, I mean, like, you know, it's it's odd to me that New, Jer New Jersey kind of gets the short shrift when all these incredible things, not the least of which is the linear city, but then all the other artists, sculptors, whatever, that it came through grounds for sculpture and the atelier, yeah. digital, what became the digital atelier, which used to be the Johnson, Seward Johnson atelier. Correct. And you worked a lot with the with that, you know, that organization to realize sculptures throughout New Jersey too. But you're like a, a locus point of history for sculpture in the area. And I don't just mean New Jersey. I mean, it's all New York and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I mean, several times you and I met by accident, bumping in at the art fair. That's right. You're an avid art fair person. Right. right. So, I mean, that's kind of really interesting to me. You represent sort of oral tradition about art in New Jersey and sculpture in New Jersey. To me, anyway. Thank you. I, I have considered myself really very lucky to have worked and met and interacted with so many amazing artists from artists who were just starting out and who are now famous to artists who were famous at the time when when I met them, you know, I mean, from every everyone from um, you know, Mark DeSuvero and Dick Bellamy coming to have lunch with me in Trenton, you know, when I was like what not even 30 years old and talking about public art, public art project. And then um, other types of interactions, uh, you know, where, you know, uh, a young Willie Cole with his studio in Newark starting out and, you know, trying to help him, encourage him. And, and, and you know, then all of a sudden his career takes off in the 1990s and, and he's, you know, world renowned today. So it's been, you know, and, and the, the reality is about New Jersey, which um, is important to remember is that, you know, so many amazing artists have come from New Jersey, not just visual artists, but performing artists, you know, in theater, architecture, the visual arts. And a part of that, of course, it's, it's because people come from around the country and they settle near New York or their, or their families um, the, the parents moved to this area to work in New York and the, and the children became really excited by the arts and they became artists. And there's some numerous stories about how New Jersey 
uh, has been so formidable in its, um, uh, cre you know, it's a place where artists grow up and they're, they're fascinated by it. Uh, the art world and the broadcasting and the theaters, not only in New Jersey, but in New York and Philadelphia. Well, a friend of mine, and, uh, the writer Thursa Goodeve pointed out to me that Man Ray had a little house in New Jersey somewhere and Duchamp right. and other people used to- Duchamp play, did, yeah. And play, play, at, play on, the, on the spread, you know, and do things and just probably socialize and do all that stuff, but also maybe make some things. And, can William, I, William T. Wiley, uh, you know, yeah, considered li you know living in New Jersey before he decided that, you know, he he preferred the San Francisco scene a little bit more. His friends were there. Yeah. Well, you know, Tom, one thing that uh, that was really unusual for me uh, as an artist is that normally when you have a show, uh, you know, a curator or a some a, an art dealer will come by and they'll see you, the work that you've amassed. You know, you've made a bunch of things in your studio by yourself alone, uh, or you know, bringing people in, having conversations. That's sort of the artist's way in New York City, the studio practice artist's way. And it's a lot more unusual to have somebody uh, like in our situation, which was uh, you asked me for a proposal, and right. what I did was I made this big proposal, et cetera, that had to do with inflatables. A, I had never made an inflatable before. <laughs> Ever once had I made an inflatable. I mean, maybe I made a little, you know, <laughs> taped together some plastic and <laughs> right? right? And uh, in the early days, we had a lot of trouble, yeah. right? And I can only imagine the meetings you had where you were like, just hold on, he'll do it, he'll get it, he'll figure it out. I mean, that's kind of extraordinary that you took that risk and took the risk on me to build a whole body of work in materials and ways that I'd never done before. It's, it's, um, it's a way of working that I really enjoy. Uh, yeah. First, you know, not to disparage the traditional way. I mean, it's a great thing to go to an artist studio and select works. I, I, that's what I did for the very first exhibition in the um, West Gallery, where your where your inflatables are located in your background behind you. Right. Uh, you know, the very first exhibition was Robert Loeb and Catherine Gilgi, and uh, with those pieces, I basically went to Robert Loeb's studio in Newark and and assembled the checklist from the dozens of pieces that he had there. But I also knew that the, the West Gallery was not a traditional space and that there isn't a right angle in there at all. Yeah. And also it has terrific wall space and high volume uh, ceilings. You know, there's, there's, there's so much more that's possible in that space. And one of my missions while at Grounds for Sculpture, and even today, is to what challenge the definition of what sculpture is, you know, to many people's minds you know sculpture is bronze and stone and a few other things but you know taking three-dimensional space and and manipulating it however however and with whatever material has always been um uh, interesting to me and uh that was also true during the public art process of my life um uh, when we would either be creating a new space or we were working with existing conditions inside or outside. So with the, so with uh, your, your situation in particular, uh, it was extremely interesting also because you are working with a, a new medium, with new mediums that are, you know, virtual augmented. Um, they're not, you know, they're not stainless steel. These things are fleeting yeah. images in, in some kind of a space. And so when you put all this together, it became an incredibly exciting uh, way to um, uh, look to the future, so to speak, and, and to really ask the question, uh, you know, where is sculpture headed? And I, I remember, uh, you know, some of our meetings, we would discuss that. And um, that's really what you had to answer. And, and, uh, and I had uh, an amazing time uh, spending time with you, uh, watching things um, develop, and uh, how you went from 
really perplexed about that space to having the aha moment that you eventually had and then there was no stopping you or us yeah you 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 gave me a deadline i think and i the deadline was the end of january i think 2015 or something to come up with a final proposal and oh my god i, was, I said <laughs> if it were a couple of weeks late would that be okay because i really didn't have an idea at that point uh, I wasn't really, I was really struggling with that space. And then for some reason it hit and the irony of all that, I, you know, I started doing things, started plinking, you know, it's always true that action begets action. And so right. you know, I started, I started getting the CAD program open and putting things, I built the CAD, that space. That was the first thing I did, I built mm -hmm. the CAD. And then I even built the, uh, you can sort of see it up above there, the, the, that, that, uh, vent system i even built that because it was so present right and, you know ironically we had a, a visiting artist at the university at william patterson uh, a woman named helen lukasova right. who's from the czech republic who you knew very well right because she was at the digital or the johnson atelier that's right and, uh and then also um you know she's an artist you've known and worked with and you know in various capacities in other ways and she was there on campus with me and we were working together. She was doing something with the robot and all this stuff. And I was sitting there like, oh God. And I was kind of showing it to her a lot. What do you think of this? What do you think of this? What do you think of this? And she was actually strangely, uh, you know, a, a part of those early days. Just sure. she sort of said, well, you're never gonna be able to make that. Or, you know, or, oh, there's something, you know. Uh, and then to boot, also, I think the the actually we did a project. Helena and I, Helen and I, did a project in uh, in the Czech Republic. Blah blah blah, and uh, it had an inflatable in it because you know I was like, let's do an inflatable project together. You know, let's do a collaboration. And I knew that I, I was shooting to test things and try things and whatever for this for the project we were going to do. And so she was the one that actually is the one that found the fabricator. Right. which we were really struggling to find a good fabricator. And right. We did. And um, so I'm really grateful to her for that. But it's just funny how these little things you know, kind of reverberate, you know? Right. Like different people at different times in their life reverberating in different ways, uh, you know, and being involved and, and um, being connected still and contributing. Because, you know, it's that old, you know, cliche, it takes a village. But, you know, really, the idea is that art comes from a single person or a single source. And you know, I guess if somebody's in their studio making work and you go and you choose the pieces, that's true. But for me, it comes from all the people I know. And the, the communication and the connectivity between people is a real part of yeah. my practice, you know? It, it's life-changing. I mean, they have, when, you, when I look back at this product, this project in particular, and all the pieces and how, they, how it evolved over, uh, you know, three years. Yeah. I mean, it was, you, things that we couldn't see coming around the corner, but we yeah. somehow were alert enough to take yeah. advantage of them. And, and, and it's just an amazing story. And that's, that's what's so satisfying about working this way. I mean- But you, you created that space that we could do something investigative. Yeah. We could find it, right? We didn't have to know it. We could find it. Right, right. yeah. It, uh, it's, um, it's, it's just an amazing way to work. And, and I've been lucky enough to have other examples, but yours is uh, so intricate and so involves so many more people because you are also uh, wonderfully generous to involve other artists. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's, a, that's kind of a rarity, you know? That yeah, no, if you, and I've said this a couple of times before, from the very day that we met and started talking about the show, mm -hmm. I said I wanted to have a show within a show. Right. That from the very beginning. And, um, you know, that was a complicated thing to do. You know, we discussed it and discussed it and discussed it. Ed and Marat will have a we'll have a fuller. We'll have another session with Ed mm -hmm. and Marat. Um, they were uh, you know, we talked about how to make the platform and how the people should be involved and who's responsible for what. And we had a lot of stuff to organize. And I remember also you were going to conferences at the time. Like, I don't, I don't know, you would know better than I, like the American Museum Conference Association. Yes. Something yeah. like and people were just beginning to talk about how other, how people were using technology in those public 
spaces in those environments. And, you know, it's kind of where angels fear to tread. I mean, you know, like, had I known how complicated it was, I don't know that I would have proposed, you know, <laughs> but, but somehow we found a way. Yeah. We found it's, a way to land it, you know? It's true. I had gone to a, a conference in St. Louis for the um, American Museums Association, oh. and there was a discussion about um, how uh, augmented reality would be and virtual reality would be really integral in helping disadvantaged populations. Yeah. Right. You know, people right. who had mobility issues or who were profoundly ill in some way, but they would still have a, uh, they would still have a connectivity point. Uh, even people, you know, people in rural areas, I mean, all of the above, the idea that technology and art, uh, virtual augmented would be uh, a great uh, equalizer for people to have that, kind of access to culture. Yeah, but, uh, but also, you know, the, the issue of managing technology in the mm -hmm. exhibition arena, which is so profound, you know, like we had contemplated for our book, for the catalog we made, that we would make the augmented reality programs available. And we finally decided not to be because we couldn't guarantee longevity and archivability, you know, which is, it, it, you know, in, in a way, the thing that really distinguishes old media from new media is that new media is temporary. Right. And that it is an old, you know, like a, those marble sculptures, man, they're going to be here for good. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, you know, it, unless I'm around to uh, organize myself and other people to retool the augmented reality for the new operating system tablet such and such and blah 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 it's gone man it's a wisp it's a it's a moment a moment in time a moment in the river but uh yeah well tom uh you know the other thing that was so wonderful is that you and i shared a lot of camaraderie mm -hmm. uh we went to china like yeah. Let's see, how many times did we go? Did we have two or three times? We went, we went uh, two times. We went, uh, the first time was uh, when, uh, after a meeting with all of the fabricators that we had uh, earmarked, it was really clear that the fabricator uh, in Xiamen, China was yeah, the was one. The and we yeah. had commissioned some prototypes first and the prototypes came and then we went um, at the end of uh, 2017, we went to, to uh, Xiamen, China and met with the fabricator. That's right. And we basically set things in motion uh, so that by the, by the early uh, months of, of 2018, uh, you would have the designs and then we would go back and physically inspect the, pro uh, the finished pieces, which we did. Yeah. And uh, on the, at the end of the very first trip, I was uh, a, a juror for a major uh, international sculpture competition That's in right. Wuhan, China. Yeah. And I called uh, the organizer and uh, asked if you could come. They and said, that guy, no way. <laughs> they, they, they were really pleased that you could come. Yeah, and so it. Yeah. it was uh, it was really a pleasure for me to bring you along to, yeah. to not only experience that, but to meet all of the artists who I, many of whom I had met and worked with on other trips to China. And uh, you got a real taste of- Oh, totally. You- Sculpture you company, a, you truly. A, 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 it was, a, and the ceremony was straight out of Hollywood. You not, know, straight was, out of Hollywood. The whole thing, let's it was, be real. But the whole is, thing uh, I, I have really fond memories of that that uh, trip and uh, introducing you to the artists and just how beautiful you know now people here in Wuhan China and they think oh COVID but yeah. I have to I have constantly remind people you know it's one of the most stunning beautiful cities with mm -hmm. the lakes that I've ever seen mm -hmm. uh, that lake district is it was uh, was landscape and poetry. And, and some of the best Chinese painting you could imagine in real life. Just, just by being there, it was amazing to see the landscape around that city. That's right. And uh, I have 
wonderful memories of spending that time and with the artists and with you having with you being there with me so no it was such a it was so revealing in so many ways it, it really was an amazing introduction for me to china mm -hmm. and to arts in china and contemporary art in china there were people you know superstars in that show yeah and there were also emerging artists in that show and that was one of the other things and and i believe one of the you were one of the curators right you were, on the jury, you were one of the juries of curators and then, but many of the other people that were on that curatorial group were artists and that's sort of where that conversation started. Exactly. Yeah, there were, there were, there were, there were uh, art uh, curators from uh, China, uh, Germany, Italy, and I was the American representative. And I love that, uh, you remember that they had this big open arena, this sort of plaza, and I, they set up this enormous screen <laughs> which was just mind-boggling to me they just they they came in the morning tick, 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 yeah. set the whole thing up like bricks and then uh they i don't know they practically played star wars when they introduced everybody yeah so you came out and everybody applauded and then the next curator came out and everybody applauded and it was just extraordinary i was like wow uh you know the the states have got something to learn about how to present art it was pretty amazing and it was cold if you remember yeah you know, reason, we, were, right. we were wearing winter coats yeah that's right, you know? that's right. yeah yeah that was lovely absolutely yeah. lovely and uh you know but at the same time we spent time in Shaman. and yeah. you know the the thing that i thought was funny in the way, same way that uh chinese people often take western names like uh, bruce Zhao is the guy that made the right the works uh the head of the company that made the works uh, you know, he took the name Bruce, for example. So too, they would do these, they, it's like there's this uh, branding thing that goes on. So Wuhan was considered the Chicago of China. That's what right. they told us. Oh, this is just like Chicago. See, we have a lake and we have things. <laughs> it's just like Chicago. And then we got the Wuhan and they were like, see, now this is Miami, okay? This is That's just right. like Miami. Yeah. And uh, which is kind of fun because, uh, you know, the... Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that it's a whole world unto its own. It's been there for a lot longer than Miami or Chicago has been there. It's ironic that they take this enormous historical experience and, and try to make it so that you and I, or you know, foreigners, tourists traveling, can understand it on their own terms. You know, It was also uh, fascinating to, uh, I set up that meeting with Andy Liu, the fabricator. Yeah, that was fabulous. He yeah. took us around, not only to his shop where they did the um, repose of metal sculpture and, and other things with uh, other types of processes with stainless steel and aluminum. But we went to the yeah. nearby bronze casting place and also- oh, no, it, was like a, it was like two hours away. It was amazing. Yeah, we the drove distance, all over the place that day. We spent, we spent hours on the road, I remember, but that's yeah. how big China is. You, we, yeah. you know, it's not, you know, it looks like it might just be an hour on the map, but it's really three hours, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And I'll never forget that, man. We walked into that yard and there, there was a crane, a huge crane, and they were pouring concrete. In Blood the light. It, it was, was like midnight or something like that. It was dark out. They just had yeah. flashlights on the thing. And we, yeah. we made our way into this foundry, which reminded me of the gates of hell. It was, it was amazing. It was almost, it was like being in a medieval foundry. If, I, medieval, you, had to, yeah. you, if you had to imagine what that was like, that was it. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, that was amazing. So we had all these wonderful experiences together. So Tom, one thing that I was really curious about, you know, I think that uh, people that might listen to this show uh, might, or, you know, our, our talk might want to know is how do curators think? How do they put it together? Why do they choose artists? Why do they choose one artist over another artist? And, you know, what's, what's that? Yeah. It's so mysterious to artists. It's a know? fair question. It's a fair question. Uh, well, you know, uh, one of the um, uh, factors is, you know, you get a budget every year to, to operate uh, in whatever organization you're in. And if you're in a large museum, you know, the fine arts gets a, a budget and you have to advocate for that and defend it. Uh, grounds for Sculpture being a little bit different because it's focused squarely on sculpture. Uh, the exhibitions program had a had a an annual budget, and I have I would have to try to figure out, you know, what was possible given 
um, the physical uh, uh, the physical reality of the property in terms of what artists would be able to do and how they could be able to do it. Um, there, uh, there's a there's a there's a schedule. I was planning three years in advance, and um, we stuck to that most most times. There were there were situations where things didn't work out, and we'd have to, you know, plug the schedule. But uh, basically, uh, I was working with um, you know an eight thousand square foot gallery, uh, a thirty five hundred square foot gallery. A 10,000 square foot building and another 4,000 square foot building plus 42 acres. Mm -hmm. So, in the when um, Mr. Johnson uh, went through the transition in 2015, one of the, he had a change in how the foundations were were uh, his foundation was setting up, uh, and the grounds for sculpture was recontextualized in another form in 2015, just to put it simply. And that meant that the day-to-day -day would not involve Mr. Johnson and the foundations that much. And that's, that's when we went into new leadership, et cetera. But during that whole process, he invested a tremendous amount of money in um, creating the East and West galleries, which were the two big additions of space. And I saw those two spaces, which are indoors, of course, as real trophy spaces for artists to really do some of the most substantial, um, you know, life-changing moments in their careers if they realize the potential of that. You did, and so did so did artists like Jay Coe and others. Uh, you, you and she, in particular, took full advantage of that space. My colleague, and that, I also had, you know, I had. Um, um, impressive budgets available for those spaces. That was key. And the process of um, selecting artists, at least from my perspective, was uh, something I said earlier. I mean, what, you know, what is sculpture today? What is it looking like? And, and you know, outside there are 200 plus sculptures made in bronze, stainless stone. What about other approaches that can coexist indoors. They may not survive outdoors, but what's possible in the interior in these interior spaces that push the definition of sculpture in our viewers' mind further and, and challenge them with this idea um, as the artists themselves too, challenge the artists to you know, push the boundaries of what's possible in sculpture. And J. Coe, um, did an amazing piece in the East Gallery that uh, changed her life. I mean, she she um, that piece uh, was made with you know tons of thirteen tons of white adding machine paper, mm -hmm. um, and you know I that was that was uh, two thousand fourteen or fifteen rather, and uh, she's still traveling some of those uh, pieces around the world. The last time I saw one was in Shanghai in 2018. I saw a different version of the one that we showed at Grounds for Sculpture. And so, yeah, part of this process is uh, of curating is to, you know, locate artists. How I found her was I saw a small piece of hers at the Phillips Collection in Washington, DC. And I basically chased her down to some little tiny village, little tiny uh, town called Piney Point in Maryland and went to visit her. And, uh, you know, that was, um, you know, that was an important, that was an important effort to do that. And it really paid yeah. off. The thing is, is that you saw something there. That's yeah. the point. She had not right. realized that scale of work or that thing. And, and I scale. realized she hadn't done anything that large, right? So part of it is that you were interested in catching an artist at an important moment in their career. Correct. Yeah. That's how I've built my, that's how I've operated my, my whole career. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to work with famous people. I mean, I've worked with many famous artists. Nice. Yeah. And Mostly. even, even with them, I've, I've pushed them to, you know, let's, let's think about this a little differently if possible. Yeah. And that's, that's been really interesting. I, I worked with Charles Simmons in the early eighties. And up, up until that point, he had never really done a public art piece at all. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I contacted him and we also got National Endowment for the Arts money for this through a grant once they saw his proposal. And, uh, you know, he, he did his very first piece in concrete and it was installed in Jersey City at Liberty State Park. It's still there. And it's, you know, it was right at, it was at a critical moment in his career too, because when he finished that, he was also uh, installing his retrospective at the Guggenheim. So the timing was just amazing. And he, uh, he's someone who did his, uh, you know, speaking of New Jersey, he was, when he was at Rutgers, he did his, he did his very first pieces in the Cerebral clay pits. The, you know, well, he was you know a, I, I think that you remember uh, I sent you some podcasts, and but you know he interviewed uh, the uh, Rick Rubin, the mm-hmm. pr- music producer, and they talked a lot about Johnny Cash. Right. And it, it was so moving to me to learn. You know, you think Johnny Cash is huge. I mean, he sold an album that was as big as the Beatles, right? And all right. that stuff. But at the time that Rick Rubin. And I think it was Rick Rubin's idea to put them together with the Nine Inch Nails songs and get Johnny Cash singing those. And, right. you know, he's late. It's late in his life. He's staring. You know, that's an existential moment. Yeah. And then he's singing these songs, which are existential in nature. I mean, it's brilliant sort of, you know, pastiche. Yeah. And um, part of it was just that Rick Rubin had the vision to say these two things go together. And the, the thing that was so extraordinary to me to learn was that Johnny Cash couldn't get a booking in a, in a motel, an airport right. motel right. lounge at right. that time. Yep. And, you know, this guy, Rick Rubin, you know, obviously a test, tried and true, tested music producer, whatever, reached into that environment and said, this is, this is a hit. This is big. This is a he big. saw the possibility. This is, yeah, I saw a possibility. And I, it really touched me because I felt the same way. I felt like you saw a possibility in me. You didn't know what the hell I was going to do or how I was going to do it. And, and at the same time, you gave me the opportunity to reinvent myself. And because these works, these inflatable pieces, I had never done anything like it. I hadn't been working with uh, with uh, augmented reality. I'd done, you know, for years, done a show with augmented reality in, in which you saw, et cetera. But to be able to blow it up in scale. And, and by the way, one of the reasons that we came up with it, I came up with it, but one of the reasons I came up with this is you said, look, man, this space has weddings and funerals. <laughs> You've got to be able to let people get in here. So you can't put marble sculptures all over there because we can't handle it. Right. So that's how I came up with the idea of these inflated pieces. They weigh about 200 pounds a piece, and that's all right. plastic because the minute the air is inside, you know, the rest just elevates. And we worked with a, a kid who's now passed away, a guy named yeah. Bill Vaughn, yeah. who, who helped me with the mechanisms and helped with programming right. so that we could just automatically roll low you know lower them and raise them and make them come and go and then that actually became part of the flavor of the piece yeah condition you know firstly the condition of the site but second of all you know your sort of confidence that i would come up with a solution for this you know well i, I you you have you've always you know i i didn't do this blindly i mean i saw the work that you had produced i mean i i was I knew of your work previous to yeah. us working together, so intel- right. you know intelligently together, but also, um, well, how am I saying? We were we were day to day during this project, literally, yeah. and so I knew of you. We had met a few times here and there. Uh, Johanna Hutchinson, the um, you know head of the ISC, um, had told me that one of your pieces was available, and we took it on loan. That's right. To- Convergent, the converged piece. Yeah, right. Bag. And uh, you know, we kind of yeah, we 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 installed that, and we get we started a conversation, and that whole conversation made me think more and more about you know this guy's got some interesting mm-hmm. things going on. Let's see what we can do. And I'll I'll never forget the first time in 2015 it was we sat down in that gallery yeah. and. And basically 
you know, laid my cards on the table and said, I'd love for you to do something in here. Yeah. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing is you'd shown me a different space. Right. It, you know, it has sort of low <laughs> ceilings, and, you know, all this stuff. And I thought, oh, man, yeah. you know, I don't know. I, you know, I don't Definitely. know what I can do in that. Yeah, the the, the space. A shot at the big space, which which was much more appropriate. Yeah, yeah. No, we it had to start somewhere, and then yeah, I, it had know, to start. The conversation had to begin. Yeah, yeah, it had to begin, and and uh, I had a similar uh, uh, wonderful experience with Paul Henry Ramirez, who who showed in your the space, your space that yeah. your installation is currently in, and he was just prior to you, and we had a similar type of you know, dialogue about, gee, what can happen here? And I, I put a lot of faith in him too, and he really delivered. And so the, you know, between the first three artists who have, four, there are four artists who showed that space, Ellen Zimmerman, uh, Robert Loeb, uh, Paul Henry Ramirez and you. And so it's been for, for people who come to Grounds for Sculpture a lot and they see how that space has changed so dramatically uh, every time. Uh, I, I, that's exactly what I was hoping for. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Well, it was a great opportunity for me and I'm, I'm always grateful for it. And, and you know, the other thing that we didn't talk that much about, but it's really the background of what we're talking about is that, you know, we published oh. a book. And, uh, you know, this book is, you know, uh, published by Scala. Yeah, there we go. You got the copy too. Published by Scala, and you wrote an essay. I wrote an essay. Eddie Shankin right. wrote an essay, uh, and also Ed and Marat, uh, right. Ed Winkleman wrote an essay, and it's a wonderful. Um, you know, a friend of mine once said to me that an exhibition is an excuse to publish a catalog, and so I really took that to heart when he said it. And and from that day forward, I'd spent years trying to get a catalog around one of my exhibitions. And um, that was, uh, you know, also kind of serendipitous. And there were a couple of things that came together to make that possible, where originally it, it, it would have been very difficult to pull off. The, so, uh, the, the head of uh, the graduate department at Rutgers when I was getting my master's of fine arts, his name was Billy Picard Pritchard. Hmm. He was a painter who, who was the first artist to show with Frank Stella. Wow. Except no one ever, he always was upset that no one ever, he would always say, publish or perish, Tom. Yeah. yeah. And I'll never, you know, he was so right. Because, you know, the thing of it is, is that um, uh, by, by seeing this publication through the way we did and by pulling in the expertise uh, of um, Ed Shankin, Ed Winkleman and Murat Orzebekov, as well as our own thoughts in this, basically it's like a, a diary of this project in terms of, yeah. of how it transpired and its meaning and it documents the exhibition so beautifully in that space that I couldn't, I couldn't be happier with how, how, it, how we all work together and, uh, how it has, and how wonderful Scala was. Yeah, Scala was fantastic. Scala, and also the designer. Scala. Deanna Lou. The designer Deanna Lou, who oh, uh, now nice. works for the Smithsonian. Yeah. Uh, she in the graphic design department. We caught her at, at the very perfect time before yeah, she took it. Right like this. Up. Yeah, exactly. She did, did so, a I mean, lucky. beautiful design. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, I remember I was ready to go. We, we had that meeting with her and I was ready to like, come on, think out of the box. And I was like, whoa, this is out yeah. of the box. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was an important thing that we did. You know, a lot of some books I did. A, I've done several books, and some of them are all done via email and this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. To go sit with the designer for two hours and talk about it. Yeah. That was, you know, we took a train to Washington right. to the offices. We, you know, we spent time with her. She totally got it. Yeah. And, you know, Tom, that's the thing about you that I really admire is, you know, you still have your foot. And I think this is really important to acknowledge. You, you know, you're a face-to-face -face person. You're, you're not digital media. Let's, you know, post some shit on Facebook or Instagram, whatever. Mm -hmm. You're like, let's be together. There's let's something. Spend the time together. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to do that these days, right now. But mm -hmm. the, I mean, you're a, you're an energetic and creative person, and I was 
very, very excited about this project and doing it. And by going there and meeting with her, she got it. She totally felt that energy. And you just don't always get that when you're online. Yeah. Uh, so that was an important and that was an important moment. And uh, she and was generous enough to come see the show, too. Yes. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yes. Which was she an amazing was, thing. She, she oh, brought I, her I, don't that, I don't know that that happens so often with design. Exactly. The connection was real. And she yeah. real that, that was a very valuable connection to make. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I think she probably misses working with us. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, next project, man. Next project. There you go. She does freelance, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but the thing is, you know, the the other thing about Publisher Parish is that, you know, people think books are dead, but I'm sorry, they're not. I mean, yes, you can get a PDF online, but there's nothing. Richard Aniskevich, the very famous op artist, who was who I was very close to and work closely with for a period of time. I always said, Tom, you have to have a book. Yeah. So I, th yeah. I think I even said to you, <laughs> Michael, you have to have a book. <laughs> so, I'm with you, man. I'm totally you with you. Another one, so get going. <laughs> yeah, we got to get another one. Well, Tom, you know, this has just been wonderful chatting with you. And uh, I so appreciate your involvement uh with this show and everything you did to make it happen oh you know it's just a wonderful experience for me Absolutely. it's a, it's a i i feel so um pleased and you know so close to what we did together in terms of you know making this happen and the book i couldn't be more ha more more pleased you know especially after having been you know i work with so many artists this was clearly one of my um best experiences and and to be able to pull it all together with the book yeah. the boo was just a, a beautiful full circle yeah full circle. traveling together yeah. the, the, you know assembling the book figuring out how to build these pieces the installation Pe people love this installation they love they love the pieces and they deserve to be seen uh not only at grounds for sculpture but in other museums and I'm hope i hope you're able to uh, show them elsewhere and also yeah. to do some work. Yeah, you know, uh, part of it is that, I mean, I, I'd love to do it too. So, uh, you know, I, it, COVID has put a damper on a lot of things, but, you know, the world will return. You yeah. know, I'm sure of it. And right. the art world will return and the desire to make and inhabit the world with creativity is, is you know, will never go away. We're certain. You know, People are always going to be looking to art for, um, uh, for comfort and for being stimulated and for new ideas. That's the arts and sciences. Science and art hold a lot of the cards in our world in terms of seeing the future and, and, and experiencing the present. Yeah, that's right. I would agree with that.